Happy New Year and welcome back to Surviving and Thriving in Higher Education. As we launch into this next semester, I decided to check in with my own professor, Dr. Moral Musavi, about how she's doing, as well as just some tips as to how we are to proceed with the pandemic still continuing on into 2021. Hope you guys enjoy it. Stay tuned for more. All right. Well, thank you for joining me on this for this conversation. Thanks, Victor. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Mauro Musavi. I'm an assistant professor in the biomedical engineering department at the University of Southern California. I kind of started this channel about, it's been about four years. So at the time when I started this, I was a graduate student and this was at the University of Minnesota. You know, the idea was why there's no actual support system to help graduate students navigate their studies and navigate the difficult times such as right now. And you know, there are a lot of interesting pointers if you know somebody, if you have a good mentor, or, you know, if you kind of like, if you're a little bit courageous and you can go to people, but some of this may not be available to a lot of folks. And, you know, if you come from like a low resource setting or, you know, again, you just maybe not have the right access to the right mentors. Right. Why not think of like, you know, open source mentoring? It's very encouraging to know that there are folks who actually benefit from the content. That's discussions about, well, what happened during COVID and what happened to research and what are the students really going through? What are the faculty going through? And are there discussions, are there pointers that we could possibly, you know, sort of share with the broader community so everybody sort of like watches something and say to themselves, hey, I'm not alone. Like there are other folks who are struggling and maybe this is this is what I can do. As sort of on the interviewer side, this has been a really, really fun sort of project to be working on because I get to call and talk to people across very like broad spectrums and different ranges um, from uh, professors who have been professors for like a really long time to professors who are just starting out to graduate students who've been doing their work for a while to graduate students just starting out. It's been a whole different swallow things and there are like similarities as well as differences in the ways that we are experiencing a lockdown in a pandemic but i think there there have been more similarities than differences there are a lot of similarities across faculty members and grad students but again depending on your stage of career and the stage of your research and also, you know, so the type of work that you do, you'd be impacted differently. So obviously when you start, you specify your lab and you know, what you need in your space to be. And then, the, you know, there's a sort of team of folks who come in and design your lab space. So that takes some time. And we were on track to get our lab. I was so excited. And, you know, when the whole like pandemic, everything was, you know, sort of like thrown off balance and the schedules were pushed back. We had delays in everything. Another week, another month that I don't have my lab, and that, that's really frustrating. You know, that holds back everything in terms of getting the preliminary data that we need for writing grants, in terms of you know, writing papers, also even training the students. I think to myself, oh my gosh, how are my students impacted? So that sort of like has been weighing down on me quite heavily. I've been trying to keep morale up, but it's it's quite, you know, it's quite challenging, honestly, to to be getting progress while not having a lab. Also, you know, when you have a young lab and you know there's like a new pandemic, everybody's supposed to stay apart. There is nobody that knows how things are done. You know, we've been trying to train you guys while staying six feet apart, while trying to, you know, sort of like say, oh, let's just imagine this is how that's done, and then let's look at pictures and let's just look at theory. But it's so different if everyone's like working together. If everyone's sort of like, you know, going through the theory and experiments all at the same time. And, you know, it's, it's quite challenging for, I would say, younger labs, because, you know, if you have senior students in the group who know how things are done, they would get, get the work, you know, sort of like get, they would get the data and get research progress. But for younger folks, um, that's quite challenging. I guess the word that I would use in general is frustrating because I like learning and I love science and I love like doing things, but that requires that I actually go into lab to do it. While reading papers and learning theoretically is great. Like I remember when we were talking about one of our experiments, it was all theoretical in my head. And I, you know, I had listened to it, I read about it, thought about it, and then I did the experiment and everything clicked. Oh, this makes so much sense. That's what she was talking about all along, yeah. Yeah, I feel like science is a very hands-on discipline, which is why labs are so important. Just from an educational standpoint, it's been frustrating to not quite understand and quite have it click because all I'm doing is looking at the theory behind it. There are sort of the sort of timeline fears. Like no one wants to be the eight year, nine year grad student. You know, we were, we were all ready to do this stuff. And then we have this one piece of the puzzle that's not quite in there and that delays the experiments for another two weeks. And that goes into writing fellowships, which have been really difficult because we have no data necessarily. As I think about the future and I think about timelines there, 
COVID has shifted a lot of that. As the series is called Coping with COVID, learning like, okay, this is a new reality we're living in. I can either sort of sulk and wallow in what I wished was true, or I can think, okay, how can we take this reality that we're in, see the different advantages that we have from staying at home? I would say from the perspective of faculty, what we're re like, we're really understanding that like everybody's impacted. Like the faculty themselves are impacted. So we're sort of like on the forefront of research. So we totally know it's so challenging. So for like certain types of work, if you're working with cells or animals, or even devices that you have to go in frequently and regularly to get your work done. And when you can't do that, you, all you can do is sort of like justify and say, look, this is what I designed to do. And this is my reasons. And that's what we're looking for, that the person can think for themselves, that the candidate can think for themselves, and they have good design, they have good sort of like reasoning, and they, they can look into the state of the art. I want to say, like, it, it also depends on the stage. So if for, for like freshman students and for like uh, students who are getting started, you have plenty of time to recover from these delays. And if you're beginning, honestly, your best work is yet to come. How has it been writing and looking for grants? when you're starting up lab and are still looking for funding and we have all these complications with not being able to grab data and things like that. So in terms of grants, I want to say there were a lot of interesting funding opportunities for creating biosensors and diagnostic devices for COVID. But at the same time, these were all really rapid or they want really intensive progress. So this isn't something that any lab can do. So this is like mostly for like really established labs, possibly even industry who has the capacity. To. In terms of other funding opportunities, programs that were on, they're still active. So I'm quite positive, honestly, even though like we've been impacted in terms of like getting a preliminary data, it was it was kind of like a little bit of a downtime and I could sit and think about like, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? As a young professor, as a professor just starting out with her lab, do you have a network or support group of other younger professors? How are you all supporting one another and dealing with the very unique challenges of starting a research lab in a lockdown pandemic. Like I myself, I have a few friends who are in the same boat as me. They're all like junior faculty who are getting started and we chat like quite regularly per se. We sort of talk about the issues and challenges that each person goes through, including colleagues in our own departments uh, and you know outside of USC. And it's, it's, I would say mostly like kind of like emotional support per se. And we talk about, oh, well, this also didn't happen. And the lab is delayed again. And you kind of hear that the other person is somewhat going through the same. And it kind of like helps you out a little bit to put things in context and say, well, it's not just me and everyone. If all my peers and all my colleagues are going through the same, but I've called up folks, you know, so junior faculty, even junior, junior faculty per se. And um, we talked about issues. I sort of did try to try to stay connected. You have to be proactive. I would see, you know, friends at conferences and events that now I don't. And if I don't like create that for myself, I don't get that support. And the same goes through for like other types of social interaction. I actually have to put it in my schedule. So right now I add it to my schedule. Look, I need social time. You know, I need to talk to people. Just the fact that, you know, the lab was a little bit up and running. Just, you know, just the fact that we had a group and we could, you know, so like meet weekly and, and chat. That's been, so, that's been so pleasant and that's been so fun. But you're right, especially during this time when those friendships by coincidence are no longer accessible. We have to actually take those proactive steps in order to create that social space for us, for our own well-being. But in terms of well-being, what else have you been doing? Group workout sessions. So we have, we had a friend who was a trainer. So we meet like three times a week and you know, it's kind of like doubles down as like a, exercise routine and I kind of like but also a fun activity because we all know each other we've been friends for so many years do what I started cooking so much more now I'm like oh how do I make ramen noodles how do I make you know kimchi how do I make all these like favorite dishes that I you know that I had and you know it kind of like pushed me to learn different cuisines these days I'm realizing that I probably want to put more effort and money into my food and, you know I can't be eating chicken and rice for you know all day I need to add a little bit of flavor a little bit of spice in there but I've been baking a lot. There's just so much more time in a day mm. and you have to create like something like that's a little bit different. Once you're at your computer, it kind of gets boring after some time. After some time, I was like, I'm not efficient in this location anymore. So I, I moved desks. I was like, well, I just need to move my desk to another bedroom. And, you know, I, we switched like 
offices with my husband to, you know, so like to create a, a change of like environment. What are some practices that both you have experienced and that you just think would be interesting uh, and good for students to, to go ahead and try out? The first thing that I think is super, super important is to keep up with communication. Because you don't have, like you, you, you used to run into your peers, like that people in your own group, people outside of your group, you know, like folks who are in the same year or like a couple of years ahead. And you had that, you know, so like discussions of, oh, where things are going, you know, so you would talk to people, you would even run into you and say your mentors, your senior students, and you had that communication going on for you. So now you don't have that. And you have to be aware that like, I need to create those like channels for communication. So if you were like someone who weren't as proactive, now you actually have to step up. So you have to think, oh, I actually need to set up a time. I need to request a meeting. If I'm lost, if, I'm, if I don't know how things are going, if something is on your mind, go ahead and send an email to your mentor. And they're probably more concerned about you than you are concerned about yourself. Keep following up because the, I mean, I know faculty have a lot going on uh, because of COVID there's so many every t every day there is something new you have to sort of like watch out for and you know you want to sort of like keep that up and be be aware that you know this is you know they're they're also concerned about you so, so you want to keep up that communication with your mentor but also with your peers basically make sure you get that that level of interaction and feedback that would help you stay encouraged stay motivated and you know stay productive so the second thing that i want to add is you know it's important to set goals for yourself where do i want to be at this time considering all the limitations that i have and you want to be realistic if you are caregiving for someone or if you've been impacted if you don't have the right working environment if you don't have access to the lab you need to factor all of those all those things in so you don't want to like set up unrealistic goals for yourself Mm -hmm. But that being said, you do want to set goals for yourself. And if you're if you're like not sure what are the goals that you should be setting for yourself, maybe you should be meeting with your mentor and say, hey, you know, I think this is where I need to be. And they would tell you if it's realistic or not. And because, you know, the pan hopefully, you know, the pandemic will be over soon. And why, you know, when you come back to the lab, when, you know, that transition happens again, you kind of want to you kind of have a good feeling about, well, I did what I could. Right. And, you know, this is something that I've learned differently. I picked up new skills, but now, you know, now I'm ready to move back to sort of like a new routine. So that kind of, I think, is, is very critical and important for you to, to stay productive. Third thing that I want to add is um, you kind of want to be aware of, you know, your, your own like social life as well. So, you know, again, you want to sort of like think, oh, you know, I have all these different things going on for me. Like, how would I think of, you know, like my interaction with my family, you know? And how would I think of my own health? Because again, you know, you are, you don't get a lot of those sort of like things that you would typically get. You're in a new routine. So you want to sort of make sure you stay healthy and sharp and, you know, don't necessarily, you know, sort of like um, fall into the habit of just, you know, just like sitting home and watching TV all day or whatever it is, you know, sort of like the, the sort of like the traps that you typically fall into. I certainly fall into the TV trap sometimes. Yeah. Um, a, a kind of a fourth thing that I want to say is, I know not having a lab is very stressful. Like I know like for, especially for experimental folks. And, but what I want to add is when you have a lab, you would typically just go there more frequently. And you know, most of your time is you doing experiments, but having that like downtime or quiet time to study and to think and to read can actually help you get more productive down the road. When you're in the lab, you are just so much more effective in terms of troubleshooting, in terms of creating something that's new and valuable. But if you, if it's the other way, if you just you have great lab skills, but you don't know what to do because you don't know what has been done before, you don't know what are the theories, you don't know what are what are the needs, and you won't be as efficient. So I kind of want to say it's true that we have like reduced access, but now you have all this interesting time to read, maybe read like a classical book, read more papers. And to think and say, well, like, I don't have somebody to look over me and tell me, like, you did this wrong. The first thing is actually the, the well-being of the students and thinking, what are they going through? How can I be supportive to them? How can I be helpful to them? And the same actually is, is valid for undergrads. Like, a lot of times we stress ourselves more than, you know, more than the environment around us by, like, creating these so sort of, like, unreasonable expectations or just not being clear in terms of, well, you have to, you know, you have to work hard, but you also have to rest and you have to sort of get refreshed and 
like it's, it's important to be productive like in a steady manner over time instead of sort of saying well i'm just going to work seven days a week but you know it's a very supportive community and the scientific community is very concerned about like every single member from you know faculty uh, graduate students and even undergrads and and I want to say, you know, I mean, I've been so, so like surprised and, you know, so like in a way reassured that the community responded so strongly, so much and offered so much support. And I want to say, you know, we hope that these video series are helpful. So if you guys have thoughts, uh, if you something specific that you're looking for, again, leave us a comment. Thank you so much for joining me on, on this call. It was a really, really Thanks fun for having call. Me. Indeed. Have a great day. All right. See ya. Bye. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, you can go ahead and check out our other videos in this playlist, Coping with COVID.